Good morning, everybody. It's so glad to see you. It's a long time no see. Glad to be preaching here in Clinton. And man, if you're in Prophet's Town, I miss you. I'll be back next week. But church, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and get them out to the book of Mark, chapter 12. We're picking up where we left off. And man, if you remember, chapter 12 is really uh, just a couple days before the crucifixion of Jesus. We're going to find Jesus on a Wednesday afternoon. On Friday morning at about 9 o'clock, he's going to be nailed to the cross. And so we're with Jesus here in just 48 hours, less than 48 hours before his death. And so I want you to kind of put yourself in his shoes for a minute. Imagine that you know that your life is going to end in about two days. And and you're in the temple somewhere that's really important to you. You're surrounded by the people who are closest to you. And uh, man, what are you going to be focused on? What are you going to be thinking about? What are you going to be talking about? Imagine you were there with your children. What are going to be some of the lessons that you're going to be teaching them and talking to them about? You know, I think I'd, I'd wager a guess that, that nobody would waste time with a bunch of stuff that wasn't super close to their heart, right? I think of every time I've been with somebody, man, as a pastor, I've gotten to spend time with people just days or even hours before they take their last breath. And those people are focused. They're intentional with what they're communicating. And I'm remembering uh, one lady in particular, she just called her kids to her one by one. And she spoke the thing that she thought was the very most critical thing to each and every one of them. And this is where Jesus is at. Two days to live. And, you know, We kind of ask the question, what's he going to talk about? What's he going to do? What's going to be kind of his last teaching in the temple? He knows this is the last time he'll ever be there. What what is he going to teach about? Jesus, he's been preaching in the temple courts all day. In the afternoon, he goes into the, the deeper court there. And around the outside, there's this little hallway. It's about six feet wide. And Jesus takes a seat there. And this is what he does in Mark 12, 41. He sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. Does that surprise you at all? Catching up with Jesus, he's got two days to live and he's watching people give. At the end of this, the, the, the text here, he's going to call his disciples to him and he's going to give them a message on giving two days? Like, Jesus, is this really what you want to focus on? But I think the fact that Jesus is on this topic, working hard and speaking to his disciples about this, gives us a a clue to the heart of God and the heart of giving and why it's so important to him. And if you're taking notes today, I want you to know this, our key thought. I want it to be in the back of your mind all day today. God cares about your giving because God cares about you. God cares about your giving because God cares about you. And we don't just need this one uh, instance in Scripture to teach us this. If you read the Bible, really all throughout is is God speaking to his people about finances and debt and greed and, and generosity and financial stewardship. It's all through the Bible. And Jesus, as he preached about 15% of the time, Jesus preached about money. 11 of the 39 parables of Jesus have to do with finances and stewardship. And he talks about that more than any other topic recorded in the Gospels. And maybe you're wondering like, okay, I hear these statistics, but why? Why does God talk about these? Why is it so important to him? If you're wondering that, I hope you'd read the words of Jesus with me in Matthew 6, 21. Jesus says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus says your heart follows your treasure. Whatever you treasure, whatever you value more than anything, that's the direction that your heart goes. The NLT says this, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. He says, whatever you're investing in most heavily, whatever you value above everything else, that's where your heart is going to be. And we can see it in people's lives with success. 
or with money itself or acquiring things. It's really easy to see when there's, you know, one particular item that somebody invests their life in. We see somebody invest their time and their talent and their, maybe their affections and all of their energy and their money into this pursuit with this one thing. And then if something happens to it, they're furious, right? Or they're broken hearted about it. We've all seen it with the guy and the Mercedes in the parking lot and he's frustrated because somebody dinged his door. And the reason is, is because he treasures that thing and it has his heart. You see, God cares about this. This is important to him because he's such a good father. How many of you are parents in this place? Raise your hand if you're a parent. You've got kids. Okay, I don't know about you, but me as a father, I pay close attention to whatever has my daughter's heart. We need to pay a close attention to that. And right now we're in this season where our oldest daughter, Zella, she's turning 18 months old. Actually, tomorrow, it's an exciting time. And it's so special because it doesn't matter what's on, on, maybe it could be her favorite show or she's playing with her favorite toy. But when daddy gets home, oh man, she comes running with her arms up and she's, daddy, you know, I get to scoop her up. And I know that my daughter treasures me right? And as a dad, I get to steward that that affection and help her direct that into treasuring the Lord in time. And why I tell you this is because it's important as a parent, it matters to us what our children treasure. Now, maybe you've got older kids and they're they're treasuring something a little bit more sophisticated than than just a toy. You know, maybe you've got kids that are teenagers and they begin to treasure, you know, a musician, And they start investing in the tickets and the posters and the t-shirts and buying the albums and paying to drive to the concerts and they're paying attention to their way of life and they're treasuring, they're valuing, they're investing in this person. It should matter to us what has our children's hearts. How many of you dads are going to pay attention when some boy has your daughter's heart, right? You're going to pay close attention to that. And God, he, he cares about this. And I want you to hear this. God cares about giving He cares about what you treasure because he cares about you. God cares for you deeply. And Jesus is watching people give in verse 41. He sat down opposite the treasury and he began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. Jesus observed them. And the word for this observe word is really intentional word in Greek. It means to gaze upon for the purpose of analyzing. Okay, now imagine at the end of our service, they're passing the basket around and one of our pastors is gazing upon you, analyzing your gift. Is that gonna make you a little uncomfortable? It would make me uncomfortable and I want you to know that we're not gonna do this, a disclaimer, that's not how we do things around here, but that is exactly what Jesus is doing in the temple. Jesus is watching the gift. He's analyzing the gift. And the truth is today, Jesus knows what you give. Jesus is watching the gift. He's analyzing the gift. It's important to him because he cares for you so much. Because he cares about us. Whatever we treasure, whatever we invest in, it's going to have our hearts. And church, how many of you know God wants us to treasure him? To treasure his mission, his purpose, his people, and his church. God wants us to treasure those things. God has a plan for us in this. All across the Gospels, when Jesus spoke about giving, he didn't say, if you give. Jesus said, when you give. He expected it. It was an assumption. Jesus knows that that part of following Jesus is giving and treasuring the Lord. That's part of what it means to follow Jesus. And you need to hear this today. Man, if you're not giving, if you're not doing that, I'm not mad at you. Our pastors aren't sitting around keeping tabs and and, and disappointed by any, no, none of that. However, I might be a little bit sad for you if you're not giving because you're missing out on one of the greatest adventures in following Jesus. Man, you're missing out and I don't want that for you. I, I want you to receive the full blessing of what God has for you, to see him come through and provide it. Man, I'm thinking back to last week, Pastor Jeremiah preached a sermon about bold obedience. And when you step out and give, you step out in faith. And sometimes that triggers opposition in your life, but you give God an opportunity to do the miraculous work in your life. And church, I want that for you. I don't want that from you. Hear me today. I want that for you. I want to encourage you, man, if you're not given, if you don't know how to process it, if it's just confusing or you're not sure where to start or you don't have a plan for it, I just want to encourage you to to just take God at his word and start with the tithe. Just make it easy. Pick it out. It's all over scripture. Just start there. 
Just start to trust God there. To tithe means to give God uh, 10% of your income. And really, we're giving it back to him because it all belongs to him in the first place. When you tithe, it's an expression of worship to God. You're giving to God through the local church and through the ministries. And, and tithing, it teaches us to put God first. I love the way it's recorded in Deuteronomy 14, verse 23. Simply, it says, the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. Simple. The NIV says it this way, tithe so you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. It teaches us to put him first in our life. And tithing, it provides for the work of the ministry. There's this awesome scripture in Malachi 3. We're going to take a look at it for the next minute or two. And God says in this scripture to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And church, you need to know today that if you're giving, if you're tithing, you are providing spiritual food for people who are spiritually starving. There's hungry and hurting people. New people are coming to church here and in Prophetstown every single week. And you're providing spiritual food for them. It's a blessing to God's people. You need to know it. He goes on and it's kind of amazing because tithing builds our faith because we get to see God's faithfulness. And this scripture is the only place in the whole Bible where God says, you are allowed to test me. He says, test me in this. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. He says, you don't believe it? Try it out. He says, give it a shot and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you won't even have room enough to contain it. Church, you need to know that God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. That's the kind of God that we serve. And when you put him to the test in this, like he tells you to, when you put him to the test, man, you give him an opportunity to do exactly that, to bless you abundantly, to come through miraculously and open up floodgates of blessing in your life. Man, those of you who are tithers, you know this and you wouldn't stop for anything. Man, I love it. It's such a good thing. You know, we're in the middle of a, a prayer campaign right now. And we say this about praying, that something happens when we pray that doesn't when we don't. How many of you believe in that? Something happens when we pray that doesn't when we don't. The same principle is true for tithing. Man, something happens when you tithe that doesn't when you don't. It breaks your dependence on your own financial security. It helps you to put him first and it helps God. Man, he gives you, you give an opportunity to bless you amazingly and abundantly. Something happens when you tithe that doesn't when you don't. And I gotta be honest with you, church, man, the areas of biggest, greatest breakthrough and spiritual growth came immediately after I stepped out and I trusted God with this area of my life. Man, it'll change your whole life. Solomon, he's the, uh, the wisest man to have ever lived. He, he wrote this in Proverbs 3. Many of you know this. He says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. And that's hard for us because our own understanding says more for me is more for me, right? That's what our own understanding teaches us. But God says, hey, it doesn't work this way with me. You need to trust me with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. He says in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. He says, don't be wise in your own eyes. Don't try to figure it out in your own wisdom and discernment. You got to rely on God for that. He says, fear the Lord, revere him, shun evil. This is going to bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Man, there's blessing all over your life when we obey like this. Verse 9, he says, honor the Lord with your wealth. This word honor means to worship, to, to adore him, to praise him with our wealth with the first fruits of all of our crops. In verse 10, he says this, if you do this, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. And church, this doesn't make sense to our natural minds, but God's economy works differently than ours. You trust him first and he'll bring the blessing. Church, it doesn't work the way that we think it does. You cannot outgive God. You can't do it. He's way more generous to you than you could ever be to him. God cares about your giving because God cares about you. I want to make a couple observations as we walk through the text. And the first one is this, if you're taking notes. God cares about how we give. God cares about how we give. In verse 41, 
He sat down opposite the treasury and he began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. He was watching in Greek the way in which they were giving. He was watching them. He was judging the thoughts and the attitudes of their heart. The, God was watching their heart as they gave. In church, you need to know this, that your heart makes all the difference. The attitude of your heart when you give, when you pray, when you seek the Lord, it makes all the difference because God's not looking at the same things we're looking at. I imagine next April, you've got to write a check to the IRS and do they care about the condition of your heart? No, they don't, right? They care about the date, the amount, make sure you sign the thing, get it to us on time. That's all they care about. But God cares about the condition of your heart. First Samuel 16 says this, the Lord doesn't look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord is looking at the heart. He's looking at the heart. He's watching the heart. And people in this day and age, and they're giving and they're praying, all these spiritual disciplines, they were putting it on display for everybody to see. And Jesus has just made this point about this a couple of verses earlier. He says, beware of these teachers of the religious law, for they like to parade around in flowing robes and receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and at the head of the table at banquets. Yet they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and they pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. He says they're pretenders. They're just pretending. And Jesus says because of this, they're going to be more severely punished. These guys weren't praying to draw near to God. They weren't seeking the heart of God. They weren't interceding for people. They just wanted to look good in front of people. And Jesus says, man, don't miss it. Don't, don't miss my heart here. The heart makes all the difference. And people were doing the same thing with giving. I'm going to try to paint a picture for you for what this could have looked like. Uh, I, I'd imagine that there'd be people walking into the temple. They've got their offering in a bag and they walk into the temple court and they kind of scan and they find the treasury that's got the most, you know, the biggest crowd at it. And I know that guy and I know her and that's, that's her husband. I know them. So I'm going to go over there and I'm going to give in front of those people. Okay, so they walk up to the treasury, which is a, a big hollow wooden box. It's big. Out of the top of it is this, this horn-shaped opening, you know, like the front of a trombone or a, a tuba, just a big opening. And you would, you would drop your offering in there. And whenever you gave, man, it would ring out. The sound was loud. If it was empty, you would be thumping and you know this loud, deep, wooden sound. If you were giving and dropping coins on top of coins, it'd be this metal clanging sound. Everybody would hear it. And so I can imagine people with their offering holding it up high, right, and dumping it out. And it's clanging, it's banging, and, and that conversation stops over there. And like, oh, I'm sorry you had to stop talking over because my offering is so loud and it's going on and on. And it's, it's so vast and it just keeps pouring out. And the bottom of the bag is just rocks and nails you know, and they're just making noise, you know. Jesus is saying, hey, the heart, the heart, don't miss the heart. People were pouring it out and putting it on display, but Jesus preached against that in Matthew 6. He says, so when you give to the needy, not if, he says, when you give, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Don't do it for that. He says, truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. And man, when you're doing something good, praying, giving, whatever, in order to be seen and honored by people, God wants to reward you, but that eternal reward is stripped away when we give from that heart. It's not God's heart for us. But let me tell you this, God does have amazing rewards in store for you when you give with a right heart. We read this in 2 Corinthians 9. Paul begins to talk about right-hearted giving. He says, each of you should give whatever you have decided in your heart to give. He's saying, man, you, you need to seek the Lord on that. You need to pray. You need to read his word. You need to seek the counsel of the Lord. Don't lean on your own understanding or be wise in your own eyes. Hear from God and do what he tells you to do. That's first. Then he says, each of you should give not reluctantly or under compulsion. I want to pause and I want to be super duper clear with you today. I don't want you to feel bullied about this. 
I don't want you to feel like somebody's heaped a bunch of pressure on you, church. That is not my heart. I simply want you to know that God cares about your giving because God cares about you. He wants your heart. He wants you. And I want this for you, church. I want God's blessing for you. I don't want it from you. Uh, that's why I'm teaching this. Paul says, give, for God loves a cheerful giver. Man, your heart is so important. We do it cheerfully with joy. We say, man, I get to give. I get to sow into the kingdom of God. And God's going to take it and multiply it. He's going to bear spiritual fruit. And God's going re re to return it back to me because he's a God who wants to bless. We get to give cheerfully. Now, does that mean it's all going to be easy? No. Does that mean it's not going to require faith? Absolutely not. It's going to require faith, but we get to give and we get to do it cheerfully. And God loves it when we say, God, I trust you. God, you're worth it. You gave everything for me, so now I'm giving in return to you. And when you give from a right heart, check this out in verse 8. God is able to bless you abundantly. Everybody say abundantly. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Church, don't miss out on that. Such a promise. Don't miss out on that. God wants to bless you abundantly. God cares about how we give. And one more observation before you, before we close. God cares about how much we give. Jesus is about to remark on this. God cares about how much we give. And again, I'm not trying to prescribe an amount or, or tell you what to do. You, you need to pray. You need to listen. You need to obey the Lord. And then you need to walk out that obedience in your life. You need to listen to the voice of God and, and read scripture. But Jesus is about to call this out. In verse 41, it says, many rich people threw in large amounts. Maybe they were making a ruckus. We don't know. But a poor widow came in and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Seems like, like, like almost nothing. But the reality is, in this day and age, this woman could have gone out and she could have bought a few meals. Okay, it wasn't much, but she could have put food on the table for a couple days. And if she went hungry and rationed it a little bit, maybe she could go for a week on that food. Jesus watches this. He calls the disciples to him. He says, guys, check this out. Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. He says, they gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything. She put in all that she had to live on. Jesus thought that gift was remarkable. That's the one that he talked about. And 2,000 years later, that's the gift that we're still talking about. And I wonder, is our gift remarkable to the Lord? Big or small, is it from the right heart? Is our gift remarkable to him? Man, these two small copper coins are tiny. They're not even an eighth of the size of a quarter. But this widow walked up. She put them in the treasury. They didn't make a loud noise. But she put in everything. She put in all that she had. Pastor and teacher Warren Wearsby puts it this way. He says, when it comes to our giving, God sees more than the proportion. Excuse me, God sees more than the portion. He also sees the proportion. When it comes to giving, God sees more than the portion. He sees the proportion. Men see what is given and God sees what is left. And by that, he measures the gift and the condition of our hearts. God doesn't care about your giving because he wants all your money. And God doesn't need your money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He wants it for you. And listen to this. God doesn't care about your giving because he wants all your money. He cares about your giving because he wants all of your heart. God wants your heart. He's pursuing your heart. He cares about what you treasure because whatever you treasure, that's what your heart is. That's where your heart belongs. It belongs to whatever you treasure. So treasure him. Treasure him. And the truth is you can't give yourself to him apart from this. 
We can't say, God, you can have all of me except all of this other stuff. We can't separate it out. We can't divide it up. Man, I want, I want to think about the gift of the widow for a moment. Two small copper coins, all she had. Two coins, that was it. Was that gift worship? Yeah, that gift was worship. Worship is two words. It's worth-ship. It's the status of having worth. And she took everything she had and she said, God, you are worth everything to me. And that gift, two coins, did it provide for the work of the ministry? You better believe it did because Jesus saw it. The heart of God was captured by this gift. He saw it. He remarked on it. You, you better believe God took that and he multiplied it and he used it to bless his people to build his kingdom. Was she putting God first? Yeah. She was putting God first before she put food on her own table. She trusted God first. And I want to ask you this. Did God have her heart? Did God have this woman's heart? You better believe God had this woman's heart. Follow me in this. She's standing in front of the treasury of the Lord. As literally as it can possibly be expressed, she took everything she had and she treasured him everything she had, and she treasured the Lord. You better believe God had this woman's heart. In this one act, she says, God, you can have all of it. You can have all of my heart. I trust you, God. I trust you to provide everything that I need. I trust you before food on my table. God, you are worth everything to me. Your word and your work is more important to me than food on my table. It's more important to me than comfort. It's more important to me than luxuries or my standard of living. God, I treasure you with everything you have. That's what her act said. That's what this gift said about this woman's heart. And that's what it said about the God that she served. Church, you need to know God cares about your giving because God cares about you. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we can't give ourselves to him apart from our gift. So treasure him. Treasure him with your gift and don't miss out. Don't miss out on the adventure of following Jesus, of trusting him and watching him come through time and time and time again in your life. Don't miss it, church. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? God, I thank you for your word. God, and I thank you that you make it clear to us God, that this is important to you. Even if we flinch at that, God, this was so important that you set time aside, your last time teaching in the temple, two days to live. God, you spoke about this. And it's not because you want our money, you want our hearts. God, you want our hearts. So God, we want to respond. We want to be faithful stewards. God, we want to say, I treasure you. God, you can have my heart. And God, I ask you to speak to us over these next few moments to do what only you can do. As you keep praying with your head bowed, eyes closed. I want you to take a moment just privately between you and the Lord, and I want you to seek the heart of God for your gift. Seek him. Maybe some of you decided long ago, you just said, I, I, I'm stepping across the line. I'm a, I'm a tither. Today, I'm going to tithe. I'm going to give. I'm going to honor God with this. And, I, and I'm just, I'm going to do it. And God sees that. God is glorified in that. God is blessed and he blesses his people with that. And you've experienced the blessing of God. And while maybe you made that decision long ago, I'm going to ask you to invite the Lord to speak to you today on that. We ask him, God, speak to us, speak to us. Would you let him speak to you on this topic again today? 
God, is there more for me? God, is there something different? God, do you want, to, God, do you want me to step out of the boat? God, do you want to grow my faith? God, do you want to bless me in a different way that I didn't see coming? Would you allow the Lord to speak to your heart? For those of you, maybe you're givers and maybe you give when you've got a little bit left over or you give when you've got some excess or, or whatever it may be, man, God sees that gift. He sees your heart. God honors that gift. He uses it. He builds his kingdom with it. But church, there's more for you. And if you don't have a, a plan for your giving, God has more for you. He's got greater blessing for you. God has a greater anointing for you. God wants to do new things. And would you let him? Would you open up your heart and allow God to speak to you about this? God, I want to treasure you. I want to worship you with my giving. Man, if you're in this place and you don't give, I'm excited for you. You have an opportunity to start the greatest adventure. And I said it before, there's been more spiritual fruit and more spiritual breakthrough in my life as a result of obedience here than, than anything else. Man, my faith got real and I started following Jesus and watching his blessing and his hand of provision on my life. And church, I want that for you. Hear my heart, I want that for you. God cares about your giving because God cares about you. Don't miss out. As we continue to pray with heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe some of you in this place, you, you know about God. Maybe you've been coming to church, maybe kicking the tires. Maybe you know about this person, Jesus, but you don't have a personal relationship with him. And you're kind of wondering, what does this have to do with me? I want you to know that this has everything to do with you. It has everything to do with you. You're not here by accident. You're not here just because somebody invited you. No, I believe that God brought you here today to begin a relationship with him. And he wants to do that by telling you about the greatest gift. We're talking about giving today. God doesn't call us to do things that he hasn't already done for us. And God gave everything for you. Not only did he give everything to you, God gave everything for you. He created you for a relationship with him. Our sin, it broke that relationship. And, and God, instead of sitting back and letting the consequences take hold, the consequences of death and separation, God loved you so much that he sent Jesus, God, in the form of a man to live a perfect and a sinless life. And Jesus gave it all for you. He gave his life on the cross for you. He wants to give you forgiveness. He wants to give you freedom. He wants to give you a clean slate. He wants to give you a relationship with God and he wants to give you eternal life. He's radically generous to you. All you gotta do is call on the name of Jesus and accept that gift. It's a gift. All you gotta do is receive it today. And if that's you, man, and you want that, I'm going to ask you to pray from the bottom of your heart, sincerely, just between you and the Lord, begin to pray and call out, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, save me. Jesus, I can't do it on my own. You did for me what only you could do. God, you made a way where there was no other way. Jesus, you died for me. You forgave me of my sins. You rose from the dead, and you're giving me life. Help me to live for you. Help me to treasure you. Jesus, take my heart. You can have all of me. Jesus, save me. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen.